so at this time, it is now 6.18, and so we need to recess to a public hearing on the 2023-24 20, budget year forecast. Uh, good evening, Chair Scott, members of the board. Uh, tonight, we're going to provide a public hearing related to the 23-24 uh, uh, general fund and all other fund budgets. Um, this is uh, hopefully the last stop of many stops that you've been on as we've, started, as we've developed the 23-24 uh, budget. Uh, as you know, uh, we provided a public hearing opportunity last month um, this is the second public hearing opportunity, and later tonight, you'll be considering a resolution to adopt the budget. The information provided right now as background is information directly from the budget that's been posted to the website that has been advertised in the News Tribune um, for the last two consecutive weeks, and that has been available at the district office for review. Um, Difficult for all of you probably to see. Difficult. Well, I should probably should have brought all my notes. Um, all ready to go. Uh, all of the budget funds uh, have been presented in the F-195 document. Uh, this page is the overall summary of each one of the funds. It provides the appropriation level uh, in each in the general fund, ASB fund, debt service fund, capital projects fund. Vehicle fund. Um, it also authorizes excess levies of $9.6 million in the general fund. That is your enrichment levy uh, that was passed by voters uh, in a previous year. Um, this is the maximum dollar amount. We are capped based on a maximum dollar amount uh, per thousand uh, dollars of assessed valuation. We're also capped based on a per Student. We are not at the maximum level. Uh, we are approaching the maximum level, but uh, we are capped at the greater of those maximum levels in statute or the amounts that voters passed. And the voters passed the maximum level of $9.6 million for the next calendar year. That is what's included in uh, this budget document. Uh, the enrollment estimates. Uh, for next year essentially are even with this current year. If you were to take a look at each one of the classes in the current year actuals, you would see next year's uh, estimates uh, for second grade are essentially this year's first graders. And we roll up each year uh, pretty close based on a demographer's estimate typically. Uh, the demographer's estimate would have us go up about 100 students. We chose not to utilize the demographer estimate as we did last year because, as you know, we did not see the increase that demographers uh, estimated. Instead, this year we went uh, even and predicted a small decrease in the kindergarten numbers. Yeah. So we're down, uh, we are predicting a lower enrollment next year than we had this year. Um, hopefully we'll be even or up, and if we are, we'll have the opportunity to uh, get a little more revenue and possibly hire staff if uh, they all come in third grade, for instance. We'll exceed our class size capacities in third grade and we'll have to hire a third grade teacher. Uh, but right now, um, based on the enrollments that we see today, we think uh, these estimates are um, appropriate and conservative for you to be able to move forward. Uh, this next slide is not from the budget document. It's a summary of the budget document. It provides a pie chart of both the expenditures by object, meaning certificated salaries, or the salaries of teachers and counselors, uh, speech language pathologists, principals, the superintendent. They fall within the certificated salaries. There's classified salaries. That's pretty much everybody else. Um, contractual services or purchase services. Those include transportation. Uh, we contract entirely for our transportation costs. It also includes food service. Um, that's the one difference that you'll see if you compare our numbers with other like size districts. We are one of the few districts that contract out both food service and transportation services. So our classified expenditures 
are typically a little lower than districts, uh, other districts our size, and our contracted costs are higher than other districts our size. And then the balance of those expenditures that you will see there are for capital outlay and for, um, I think benefits is included in there, which is uh, over the last 20 years, that benefits number has just gone higher and higher and higher, and it's typically due to pension costs and healthcare costs. So, um, which we are really outside of our control. The only control we have related to those benefit costs are how many employees we hire. On the revenue side, uh, it's by source, which is uh, levy, state funding, federal funding, and other local resources. And the biggest part of that is our general fund, uh, or I'm sorry, state resources, both state general and state specific. So state general is uh, the amount that's generated specifically based on the number of students we have. And state specific would be things like special ed grant, learning assistance program grant, or the lab grant, uh, multi-language learner grants, all of those specific grants that are targeted for specific purposes. That, uh, those state funds make up the vast majority of our funds. Levy funds, the second biggest category. Uh, federal funds uh, comes in third, if you think of local, state, and federal. Uh, we have the most number of requirements and spend the greatest amount of time dealing with federal requirements and they provide the least amount of resources. That might have been uh, not entirely a, a fact-based comment, it is an opinion-based comment. They get too little resources for the amount of money they provide. Uh, the debt service fund budget, uh, this is the budget that pays for, that captures all of the payments for bonds. It also captures all of the receipts for um, bond, uh, for property taxes that are collected for bonds. This is the last year we'll be collecting um, money from taxpayers for bond payment. Um, and it pays, it will pay off the bonds. So you'll see we're collecting about, uh, we're collecting significantly less money than the amount we're spending, but that's because at the end of the year we'll have a lot of money sitting in the bank ready to pay off the bonds at the end of this calendar year. So um, at the end of the year, we will end with under a million dollars in our debt service fund. And some of that money is allowable to be paid for non-voted uh, non debt or the $4 million we borrowed for the McNeil Street property, and some of that will just be held to pay for startup costs associated with the next bond. Uh, but it also, if the board decided not to move forward in the next several years with a bond, that money would be refunded to taxpayers. Uh, the ASB budget cap captures uh, the amount of money that is collected and distributed by associated student bodies in all of our schools, high school, middle school, um, and all of the elementary schools. So uh, there's multiple processes for approval of those budgets. They're approved uh, by students first, and then they um, are all combined in one fund budget, and they are brought to you for approval of those overall dollar amounts. Typically, the, we have an interest in making sure that the amounts collected are fully spent for the, to the benefit of those students in a relatively fast time frame. It's not always in the exact year, but it, it typically can be in the next couple of years after collection. The capital budget, you'll see that's uh, much slimmer than you've seen in the past. The capital budget next year is going to be collecting primarily impact fees, that's the revenue uh, that you see uh, posted, and all of that money is transferred in the budget to the debt service fund for payment of the $4 million debt for the payments over the next five years. So we're collecting impact fees to pay for the land, to pay for growth. Um, there's a combination of transfers from the general fund and the capital projects fund to address the debt. If a capital levy that you'll discuss later passes, then these transfers would no longer be required. But right now we haven't passed a capital levy and I've included them so that in the event the capital levy is not adopted by you or passed by the voters, we have capacity to be able to pay the debt that has been incurred in restructuring. Um, something that hasn't been covered in prior uh, 
prior meetings is our four-year outlook. So um, as part of the budget document and the budget resolution, you adopt a four-year outlook. Uh, what I have done is put together a four-year outlook that includes an increase in the levy resources consistent with uh, what voters have approved, and I've added a fourth year that voters have not yet approved and assumed uh, the same level of funding in the fourth year that voters approved in the third year. So um, you'll see a pretty significant increase in local resources over the next couple years. You'll remember that voters approved uh, a four-year levy that included uh, an increase. That was offset by a decrease in the debt service payments or our bond payments to ensure that there's no increase in overall taxpayer, uh, the taxpayer rate. But we'll see an increase in the levy resources. I estimated a 3% increase year over year in state resources, no percentage increase in federal resources. So um, I, I'm making a relatively conservative assumption in all of these areas. Uh, the 3% increase in state uh, resources includes both enrollment growth and it includes what would be typically a COLA or cost of living adjustment that's provided by the state. On the expenditure side, I've made assumptions associated with 3% increase in overall expenditures year over year over that four year period. Um, we will likely experience inflation uh, that uh, may in individual years exceed that 3% target. But what that means is we'll have to make decisions to make reductions in other areas to offset any increases that are in excess of 3%. Um, so if, for instance, insurance costs are 20% more, we will have to find reductions in other areas to hit that 3% overall expenditure target. Um, with those assumptions, you can see that uh, we would project that over that four-year period, we would get back to a 6% ending fund balance, 6% uh, uh, expenditures or consistent with policy 6022, um, the minimum fund, fund balance policy. I had hoped that we could do it in two years, uh, but looking at a four-year outlook, um, we still may be able to do it in a shorter amount of time, but using conservative revenue uh, and expenditure numbers over a four-year period gives us more flexibility to move forward. And if we get additional resources in the interim or find additional savings, we'll be able to add to that fund balance in years two and three and potentially hit those targets earlier. And I covered that. Uh, I also wanted to include the financial indicators uh, from OSPI. So what I did was, uh, made the assumptions from the F-195F, I projected ending fund balances, average cash balances, uh, the amount of money that would be collected over expenditures, and used that information to determine where we would be on the OSPI financial health indicator outlook. And you can see by the fourth year, uh, we end up at a 3.0, um, which is, uh, not a four, but it's probably as high as uh, a, the district is going to get without socking away a ton of fund balance, uh, far in excess of your your fund balance policy. You would uh, likely need to advise us to change policy in order to get a better target. Uh, that concludes the presentation of both the budget and the four-year outlook. I'm happy to answer any questions about the details. I did bring uh, all of the budget and the backup documentation. I just hope you don't make me use it. Let me, uh, Victor, do you have any questions or comments for Mr. Lewis? Uh, no, I do not. Okay, thank you, sir. Jen? Okay. Um, I have a question just regarding the four year uh, projection. What is, oh, sorry, thank you. What is the, what is the estimation each year for growth for FTEs that's built, kind of built into this? Uh, not for enrollment. Um, the overall expenditures uh, and 
the revenue are both targeted at 3%. So um, the percentage varies from year to year. There are enrollment bubbles that uh, flow through. So sometimes you have a big year move out and there's a high birth year. So it's not a consistent percentage each year, but we are projecting a small amount of growth each year. You can see the, um, I'll pull that information out. We've got uh, from 23-24 to 24-25, we are projecting a small decrease because we've got a, a enrollment bubble exiting. And then we have increases of about 15 students uh, from 24-25 to 25-26, and then 10 students from 25-26 to 26-27. Again, if I'm uh, looking at the demographer data that we've been provided, these are very conservative increases compared to what the demographers would uh, suggest. Uh, as I think I told you at the last meeting, I'm uncomfortable relying on demographer data given the last three years. I'm much more comfortable utilizing a cohort uh, roll-up number um, for at least the next three years until we actually see a pattern develop in our data. Um, right now, there's not a pattern, and it's difficult to make a predict prediction using the rear view mirror. So um, doing the best we can with the moment given an uncertain future. I have a question for you, Sean, that are other school districts similarly projecting their enrollments that, uh, because it's been really strange after COVID, you know, the students have left, and uh, I'm just wondering if you talk to other people in your position that in neighboring school districts, are they feeling the same anxiety for the students' growth over the next few years? I don't know if they're feeling the same anxiety. I'm feeling a lot of anxiety. So, um, and part of that is the combination of uh, the, like, the unpredictability, what I would say is the unpredictability of enrollment combined with our very low fund balance. That's what, that's what causes me to be anxious. Um, there are most other districts right now are very concerned about enrollment projections but not all of them have the same low level of fund balance that we're walking into next year. So they may have some capacity to weather a, you know, a hundred FTE reduction. We, at this point, have very little capacity to be able to weather that kind of uh, miss, which is why we are projecting probably lower than what any other districts in our similar situation would be. You're being more, being more conservative on the FTE projections than you would otherwise be. I have a question about the expenditures and the three per, like the assumption of three percent expenditures. Are you comfortable with that? Given, I mean, and are you comfortable with that assumption? I assume you are because you put it in the budget. Um, but you know, the question of inflation and costs that might come up that maybe we're not thinking about. I'm a little bit kind of like, ugh. And then I'm also wondering, is that based on the assumption of the same sort of budget that we've adopted now with all of the cuts that we've included? Like you have not increased spending. It's sort of like we're staying static with our costs and the cuts that we have through those next few years and then that 3% expenditure estimate. Does that make sense? Yeah, you... it, it does. Okay. Um, so if you're asking whether I believe in Inflation within the K-12 realm will be at 3% over the next four years. The answer is no, I don't believe that. I think it's going to be higher than that. I think uh, one of the interests that I heard from the board, and certainly the superintendent, is that we wanted to be able to get back to that minimum fund balance target that the board established. Um, as I was looking at what are reasonable expectations in terms of holding expenditures? Uh, I thought a 0% increase is unreasonable given the inflation that we're facing everywhere. But a 3% target still will require, I believe, in some of those years, us to make reductions, whether that's staff reductions or other reductions. We will have to make some sort of uh, limit the amount of expenditure growth. And so, there, again, there may be cases where some costs will go up, 
benefits may go up more than the 3%, which may cause us to have to do some contraction in other areas. But we have control about of that. What we have less control of is the revenue growth. And I feel very comfortable with the 3% estimate for state funding and the 0% for federal funding. I think those are conservative, rational numbers. And the 3% expenditure growth gives us a real target. Um, and I would say, unlike what we've used before, I think we have um, real numbers early on to start shooting for a year from now. And in other districts I've been in, I've been accused of talking about the next budget before I've even got this budget passed, but that is kind of the way I roll. Like I'm, we, uh, once we got this document to a point where I felt comfortable with this year's budget, I'm already thinking about what is next year's budget? What kind of adjustments will we have to make? How can we start prepping ourselves and prepping staff and getting the system ready for both increases and decreases that we will have to make in the following year? Um, that's the job that we have to do. Um, and we have to start at 12 months ahead of time, not two months ahead of time. I think that's a super important piece for, for the board and to, to make sure that we understand and that to be able to communicate that to like a marathon and not a sprint over the next four years and we don't have an immediate solution. This is the solution and it's longer term than I think a lot of people want it to be, but it is what it, what it is, so thank you. I have a question. Thank you. Uh, so it's interesting, I just, it's an interesting number here. So like with running start, 20, 21, 22 is 152 and then this current year is 159, and then we're budgeting for 135. Is there, are we seeing less people going into Running Start that causes that drop? I think we're hopeful that a lot of the programs that we are introducing at the high school will encourage students to stay with us rather than go to current Running Start. Um, we're not sure about that. But a change of 15 FTE uh, isn't an unreasonable number. Um, if we do see those 15 additional FTE go to Running Start, that will both increase the cost and increase, uh, it, it will change the revenue structure slightly. We'll get the same amount of revenue. We'll have to forward some of that revenue out to, um, out to Pierce College most particularly. 15 students would represent about 100. And then the dropout re-engagement enrollment, what is that? Is that just that we project less? No, that's a program, uh, you've talked thought about it as Pride Academy. Um, so Pride Academy is a separate, it's called an open doors program, where dropouts are able to re-engage with the system um, and the district receives separate funding it's not really an a ALE program, it's a dropout re-engagement program. And it's not designed to be um, a core component of our regular program. It is really designed to recapture dropouts from the system. And we expect that we'll have about six, on average, six students. What typically happens is we have very few, or what should happen, very few students at the beginning of the year. Some students drop out. Uh, Hopefully they don't, but if they do, we find ways to re-engage them, and we may have up to 12 by the end of the year. So the average of six FTE may look like zero in September, one in October, and then we may have a lot in se second semester as we re-engage dropouts. They may not always be our dropouts either. Thank you. Um, um, uh, just for everybody's edification, uh, all of our Running Start students, when they go to Pierce College, doesn't the college get like 93% of the apportionment and we keep 7% or so for administrative bookkeeping kind of? Yes, I would say, I, I frame it a little differently. The 93% is exactly right. Um, yes. That, that is exactly the number. Um, it's. It doesn't, that 7% doesn't cover the academic support that the high school provides. 
because we still provide counseling support and those other, it doesn't cover administrative overhead. It really covers the academic support that continues to be provided to those Running Start students. So if we have 10 more students decide that because higher ed at a four-year school is so expensive, they're gonna choose Running Start, uh, 10 more students could cause problems in our budget. You could. I would. At this time on the agenda, it says we should have comments from the audience regarding the public hearing on the budget. Uh, for everyone's edification, this is uh, for information only, and the board will address uh, adopting the, uh, the budget next month. Uh, there's likely to be some fine tuning on the budget. Bunger, 2702 MacArthur Street, Dupont, Washington. Uh, number 9A, whole business, approval of the budget for 2023-2024. If one of you board members, during that discussion time frame, could ask a question, because we can't find this information. We, we can find some, but we'd like some actual information. What was the district administration's budget in 2019-2020? And what it is going to be in this budget, 2023-2024, we'd like to know the feedback, everything said, cut district administration. Uh, but what it looks like, we've cut teachers, we've cut paraeducators, we've cut supplies, we've done the bare bones. And I understand that. You're, you're right-sizing to the funding. Um, but the... The mission of the school is it should be the students' needs. And the students need teachers. The teachers need paraeducators. Students, teachers, and paraeducators need supplies. And that's what's getting cut the most. Thank you. Okay, it is now uh, 6.47. So we'll return to our... Uh, We'll end the public hearing and return to the uh, regular agenda and